So we have another speaker. His name is Tim Cannon. He's also from the Grindhouse Wetwares crew, and he's going to be giving a talk right now. So Tim Cannon, step up to the mic. Hi everybody, my name is Tim Cannon. I'm uh, here to talk about practical transhumanism or what I call the grinder way. Um, for those of you guys who might not know, uh, Rich Lee talked about it a little bit. <clears throat> uh, we consider practical transhumanists to be anybody who is attempting to see these changes within their lifetime and working towards small, acceptable change so that we can uh, kind of accomplish some of these things possibly in an iterative fashion rather than waiting around for it to be delivered to us. Um, so what is practical transhumanism? I can, to, to illustrate that, I'd probably show you some of the stuff that we're working on and it'll paint a better picture and then I'll go into some of the more specific parts of our uh, what you might call ideology, but we're really just kind of a loose group of idiots who hang out in a basement. Um, okay, so uh, the first device that we built was called the Bottlenose, and this was a device that um, when I got my finger magnet in 2010, and it's kind of become a grinder rite of passage, you know, you know, to, uh, the blood sacrifice to the grinder gods, and um, I, I started feeling all these fields, and I was very interested, in, and, and I found it fascinating. And, and but it, the the first thing that kind of sprung to my mind was, you know, I, I can interact with this with electricity, so that kind of makes it a digital port. So I should probably do more with this than just kind of look at electrical fields. Um, so we kind of said, well, what, what would be an easy way uh, to start this? So we took a range finder. Uh, which works on ultrasonic, and um, fed the range data into a microprocessor and then converted that to a delay signal for uh, a pulse on an electromagnet so that as things approach the device, my finger magnet will actually vibrate faster as they approach and slower um, as, as they uh, move away. And then at that point, you can start to kind of sweep it around the room and get an idea for the landscape of the room, draw a map in your head and kind of you know, know where things are. You can close your eyes and walk around a room. And uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest running with it because you'll, you'll hit a wall. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that now I can do multiple sensors. I can take uh, heat data. I can take radiation data. I can take all sorts of data and immediately know if something's amiss. And it's part of my experience. It's not like checking my cell phone for messages, it's me. Um, and it's a, it's a really simple concept and it's really familiar feedback. So there's no real confusion as to what's going on. More is more, less is less, um, and, and everybody knows how to determine that. Um, so now, uh, and we also use a very simple platform for development so that we can kind of get people in and get people moving uh, quickly. We use, an, we use Arduino, which is you know, the maker's friend, the hacker's friend, um, and is a wonderful system. Uh, we, we, we use it a lot. Um, so then um, we started in with something a little bit more complex with a device that we call Heled, which we're now in the testing phases for. Um, we wrote uh, a really large uh, suite of extremely robust tests um, 
you know, assuming that everything that we did right went perfectly the first time, which we all know happens in testing. Um, we threw it in a, a tank after we tested some kind of our own uh, bioproofing materials and waterproofing materials, and you know we were excited and you know the lights were going off and everything was going on, and then uh, it failed catastrophically and we cried. So um, then, but uh, the the basic idea of the device is that it has eight LEDs on it, and they would shine up through the skin. Telling the time, displaying the time on the surface of your skin in binary, because we're nerds and we like to pretend like we know a lot more than people, so we do things in binary. Um, and uh, on the flip side of it, you have a temperature sensor and a heartbeats per minute sensor. Uh, the heartbeats per minute sensor we use is uh, open source hardware and open source software uh, made right out of the maker movement. It's actually available on MakerShed. Um, and there's an SD card and a Bluetooth module so that it'll kick right up to your phone and you can get that medical data and put it on the cloud and run algorithms on it and, and see what happened. Um, so, and, and these are all really simple ideas. They're not difficult, but they're profound um, in, their, in their implication. Um, we also do some brain stimulation. That um, beautiful looking Indian gentleman is my friend Sherrod. And um, he, he is uh, putting uh, two milliamps uh, through his dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, uh, or roughly thereabouts, and uh, cathodally stimulating the other side, the left side. He's anodally stimulating. Now, uh, this is called transcranial direct current stimulation. And there's a mountain of uh, documentation on it. Uh, and there have been, there's yet to have been double-blind studies, uh, or at least up until we had figured it out. And then we designed some double-blind studies to kind of analyze that data. And we have that data uh, publicly available. We make everything publicly available and open source. Um, it's, it's a really low-cost technology to, to use. And basically, the effect of doing this is, uh, well, they've shown increased working memory, enhanced concentration, things like that. Uh, some people actually call it overclocking your brain. I wouldn't quite go that far, but it really, uh, I've, I've used it and it, it does help me concentrate. Uh, but it's really easy to do. It's really easy to understand. It's really easy to get into this kind of grind. Um, no blood required. Usually that's, a, that's kind of a breaking point for a lot of people when they see that scalpel. They're like, you know, maybe I'm not as hardcore as I thought. Um, <laughs> So, um, you know, what is practical transhumanism from an ideological standpoint? Um, well, it, it's iterative. Um, we, we borrow from agile software development. I'm a software developer by trade. And um, we, we borrow from agile software development. We don't make these grand goals and this perfect plan and, and then, you know, write out everything and then kind of, you know, try to get there. And then when we fail, we say, oh, shit, and then go back to the very beginning and plan it out again. Um, we, we go iteratively. We, every two weeks we have a meeting on a Google Hangout because we have people in Australia and people in Minnesota and people all over the place. Uh, we drove here from Pittsburgh uh, picking up people along the way, picked up uh, Rich in St. George and Ian flew in from uh, Minnesota. So, um, and every two weeks we have this meeting where we reprioritize and reevaluate our direction and say, you know, what are we doing, where are we going, and how do we get there? And we, we dole out tasks to each other and monitor one another's uh, progress in, in kind of a, uh, some people call this methodology scrum, where you're running down the field every two weeks and then um, you know, reevaluating your plan. Um, you know, we document frequently, and we document as much as we can. Uh, I have everyone in the team fill out these uh, scrum reports uh, so that they, you know, we get this story of what happened. They all call them TPS reports and, and make fun of me and then don't do them. Um, so, um, yeah. And, uh, okay, so, and, and we, we really encourage people to try new things. You know, we, we hear somebody come in with a, you know, come bebopping in with a, a crazy idea. And um, I think the, the standard, particularly on the internet, the standard intellectual thing is when you hear somebody pitch a crazy idea, that you think is unscientific, you are to ridicule them so as they don't have ideas again. And um, 
we think that this is a really poor way to do things. We think that we should be uh, encouraging people, um, you know, like science fiction does. You know, I just can't imagine somebody walking up to Asimov and be like, you're an asshole. You know, like, you're an idiot. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's also unique. Um, we, we draw from this vastly different life experience uh, of all of the people. You know, we have, we have a guy who's in school for, for physics, and he, he, well, he's, he's a double major uh, math and physics with a minor in Spanish. That's Ian. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, we, ha we also have, um, you know, people who are, are coming in from, from sales, and we have people coming in from, you know, all sorts of different fields, and they're looking at problems differently than what I would say your classic academic is. You know, where, and, and the question that we tend to ask is, is there a rigidity of mind that occurs that allows people to do this? Because I'll tell you, I went to a two-year tech school for software, and it damn near killed me. But I read scientific publications and data every day by myself, motivated by myself to learn. I knew nothing about electrical engineering when I stepped into this, and now I'm, I'm doing calculations that I, I never really thought I would even understand. You know, they've got symbols in them that you know, they just look crazy. Um, so, um, you know, but we have a common thread, and that's that we believe that, that the transhuman future is here. It's, it's not coming, uh, it's here. And we can start to do these things with our body and we have to break down these social taboos. If we, don't, if, if we think we're gonna just be a community and an island of itself that doesn't break down these taboos, we're sorely mistaken. I mean, you can ask, you know, ask anybody, you know, look at any account from the Salem Witch Trials and see how you know, people feel about making your own little private community of free thinkers. It's not, it's not well received. Um, so you know, we have to push these taboos out of the box and, and leverage, re leverage that out-of-box thinking, leverage that kind of rebellious spirit uh, that you see in these countercultures to push this thing forward and break those taboos. Um, we also believe in making this highly, highly accessible. Affordable, flexible, open, um, and I'll talk about that a little more, a little later. But um, you know, we, we we want these things to be so that somebody who is not wealthy, somebody operating out of a hacker space without an awesome lab, can figure out how to start participating in this particular aspect of transhumanism and and citizen science, really. Um, you know, so why should you why should you support tr practical transhumanism? Uh, well, again, you know we're we're flexible. We we want to take people's crazy ideas and turn them into realities. And where we can't do that exactly, we want to we want to figure out what we can do. Um, a, a guy came into the Biohack Me forums a couple uh, a couple weeks ago, and he 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 said you know that he was um, you know a furry, and that he would love to be. Half man, half animal. And, uh, you know, a couple of people kind of, you know, you're fucking weird and whatever, and, you know, kind of gave him shit. But really, uh, it turned out that my buddy Sherrod had, had uh, sent this guy to us, and he was, uh, one of the, he was one of the most talented electrical engineers and a, and a supreme professional, uh, had written books. I mean, I don't want to give away the guy's identity, but, uh, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, um, he was a talented, uh, extremely talented electrical engineer, and, you know, what we should be saying to these people is, we well, you know I can't do that, but how would you like the sense of smell of an animal? Maybe we can work on just that little feature. Uh, what can we do for you? What, what can we make this compromise? Um, open. We want to open the source to this stuff. We want to open the hardware. We don't want it to be closed up because if you look at examples of citizen science and, and open source hardware and, and hacking, you see, thing, you see social benefits that you don't really predict. Things like uh, in the Arab Spring. You know, in the Arab Spring, you had a, a, a company, a telecom company, and a government, you know, uh, you know Bastion, two, two things known for helping people with their freedom. And um, they shut down all of this stuff. They shut down all the internet services. So guys went and cut open telephone poles, hacked them into uh, satellite receivers, and Twitter's back up. You don't own us. We own you. Um, and uh, as far as it goes, you know, we're communal. We, we, we love hacker spaces. We, me, and, uh, me and some of the guys have gone to, uh, we went to Detroit, and, and to Omnicorp. 
Um, and when we were up there, we met guys from Level 1 Hacker Space in Kentucky. And we had a bottlenose device with us. And, you know, we said we got these finger magnets. And, and uh, a guy from Level 1 said, you know, three of my crew got finger magnets. And they said, okay, well. And they came up to us and they said, we, got, we heard you got this device that interacts with finger magnets. And so we gave it to the guy and, and he grabbed it and he had a big smile on his face. Holy shit, I can't believe this is happening. I'm navigating myself to the beer tent. And off he went. And, you know, and, and he found his way to the beer tent. I was, I was pretty happy. So um, that would have been embarrassing. I'd have blamed it on the beer. Um, so, um, also, we focus on sensory experience and, um, you know, small but profound, you know, and, and I think the two are confused. You know, I don't use my finger, I, I probably use my finger magnet every day, but I don't really, uh, it, it's not a, a dramatic impact on my life. It's not, it, it's not that sort of thing, but it's so profound in knowing that there is this invisible world that people can have access to seeing um, with a small enhancement and, and the things that you can do. I, um, I actually troubleshot a laptop power bridge issue once by basically hovering my hand over the power brick and hovering my hand over the power bridge and realized that the power bridge was kind of like sputtering and I could feel it just kicking around in there and doing funny stuff and it looks like it's your laptop power bridge. So. Um, uh, Real-time, highly diverse data is also very possible in, in this that in, because if you get these devices collecting data and you add a small Bluetooth module, which is extremely easy, and let's face it, everything's better with Bluetooth, um, you know, you, you can get these, these uh, diverse data sets from all over the country because you have these hackers using the open hardware um, you know, you, and, and reproducing your methods and, and mentioning what they've done and then kicking that data up to you and you're, you're getting it from all over the place and it's not targeted so you can start running like generalistic out like general algorithms on it and and trying to find patterns there um, and you can imagine a time when perhaps if something's you know reading glucose which is a very very small deal but if it's kicking up to a satellite all of a sudden a tsunami hits you know who's the hungriest, so where do we get the food first? You know, these sorts of things. Uh, you just simple, and that device that I just described, I mean, you're talking about $10 in parts. You know, and, uh, you know, but uh, what is it, you know, $5 million in bribe money to your local government institutions. Thank you. Um, you know, and honestly, the opportunity to perceive new sensory experiences has just been amazing. Um, having technology... Uh, literally talk to my finger, this artificial sensory organ, and having infrared sensors and knowing that I am sensing the infrared spectrum, not my device that I'm then reading, me. I'm sensing that. Um, so, long term goals, and I'm probably hauling ass here, aren't I? I'm going real quick. So, um, long term goals um, voluntary organ replacement. Uh, we, we just think that we should be replacing these parts before they go bad. Um, we, don't, we don't see a point in, in keeping something around that's obviously going to go bad and, and waiting for it to go bad before you've finally got the justification to get that heart that works better. That doesn't seem very smart to me. Um, we can make, some, in some of these parts, we can actually make better than nature does, make them more efficient, but more importantly, better feedback. Um, you know, my, my, as I understand it, the current way in which my heart alerts me to the idea that there's a heart problem is that I have a heart attack. That is not a good system. Um, and, uh, you know, but yet if, if, you know, anybody with an artificial pancreas or, you know, artificial heart, they can actually tell you like data metrics on what their heart's doing and, and give you nice solid data. I would like that data because I like bacon a lot and, and my heart's probably not doing well. Um, and, and I've got a history of heart disease, so this is you know, quite near and dear to my, um, you know, my family history. It's quite near and dear to my heart. Um, okay, so, um, and also, redefining the sense of well-being, I think, is, is also going to be a big deal because, again, your, your body kind of says, you know, you're sick. 
you're, you know, and, and it, it generalizes, you know, localized pain if there's localized pain. But you don't really get this kind of beautiful little, like, OnStar kind of package. OnStar kind of package. And, uh, and saying, you know, okay, well, I'm, I'm orange. Or, hey, you know, your heart's going to have a heart attack in, like, three months. You might want to, you know, talk to your doctor. Um, Brain-computer interface, uh, this is the holy grail of uh, uh, biohacking, in my opinion. We're not going to be the first people to deliver it. Uh, you know, that's going to be, you know, it, as a matter of fact, we, we couldn't be. It's already really been uh, delivered um, in, in the experimental stages. But what we'll probably do is build it at low cost, uh, you know, uh, either reverse engineer or openly steal a patent. And, uh, you know, then open the source, make it easy to use and uh, make it iteratively, desi you know, iteratively design this so that you know, we add features as we go. Um, and a short uh, caveat in, is that we need to start focusing in, in the biohacking, biohackers in general, need to start focusing on the idea that it's not just the technology, it's also the procedures. Um, you know, we need to make these procedures easy to do and easy, easily accessible um, you know, nurses do a lot more now because of technology than they did, um, you know, say 50 years ago. And um, when I think about these sorts of things, you know, I think if you have a procedure, a procedure, that's a set of things that you do applying a certain skill. If you have a procedure that requires seven years of school and $250,000, you have a shitty procedure and it needs to be improved. Um, and a, a small piece on citizen science and the, and the counterculture. Um, this is my daughter participating in citizen science with us down at our mini hacker space. Um, uh, citizen science is where um, amateurs, uh, you know, get the data together and um, you know aggregate all of that data, and um, you know they're 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 passionate hobbyists. And um, a particular. Uh, uh, example of this is the game Fold It. Um, Fold It is a protein folding game, and the best protein folder in the world is a uh, executive assistant from England, uh, middle-aged woman, and not interested particularly in biology. Um, how is she doing so much for protein folding research when there are so very few doing it that that are actually interested in biology and have have a biology degree? Well. They found a way to tap this particular talent that has nothing to do with the field of study in which it's benefiting. And we can tap these things if we make this stuff accessible and, and we make these procedures easy to do. We can find new skill sets in people who may not be uh, thought of as, as, as interested or, or, or your traditional academics. And then, you know, of course, you have your counterculture. And Countercultures, um, you know, Wikipedia says that, uh, you know, countercultures are basically any culture that, you know, varies from uh, the regular social norms. However, one thing that it also mentions is that when oppositional forces reach a critical mass, countercultures can incite dramatic cultural change. If, if the counterculture, and that's why I would like to say that the, the counterculture is responsible for harboring citizen science into the future and, and making it a primary cultural value because you're starting to see uh, you know freaks geeks and weirdos like really interested in science I mean I was walking around talking to people last night and every every conversation I had was was a science conversation and and yet all these people are young and they're hip and they're you know really I mean, well I just said hip so clearly I'm not but uh, you know they're just really you know it's, it's really interesting to see this um, emergence of interest in science, you know, it's not just for, it's not just for nerds anymore, I guess. Um, so, again, uh, I, we need to break through the idea that science is best left the pro to the professionals. Um, make it more interdisciplinary uh, so that you have people trading techniques through fields of science where they never would have seen that thing. You'll have a situation where somebody's just stumped on something Somebody from a, a whole other industry will just kind of come along and go, well, did you try turning it upside down? Oh, well, maybe that's your problem. Um, and I think that this will also cause a whole host of new techniques. And um, because of the way in which interdisciplinary teams kind of feed off of each other and find ways to do these sorts of things for uh, cheap. So 
If you have uh, any other questions about uh, grinding or uh, anything like that, um, I, I brought a slew of people. Uh, there's six of us here. If you see any one of these freaks or weirdos, you can ask them questions, and uh, they'll go ahead and answer them. Uh, but uh, I think I'm out of time. So thanks, everybody. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody in Grindhouse Wetware.